thank you. Um, I thought I'd just kind of go over what's changing, and uh, in short, it's everything. Um, and just to give you an idea of what we've been doing and, and what's been going on from our perspective, um, insurers, we're looking at insurers who have, who have filed all new plans in the individual and the small market um, and are still in the, in the process of filing. You can have on and off exchange filings. The, the on exchange uh, filings are completed, the off exchange are still going on. They actually have through, um, through this, although they have to start selling October 1st, they have through December to, uh, to, to file with us. Um, insurers are also facing some, some new taxes, which are going to impact people for individuals. Um, you've got the individual mandate, you've got plan design changes, you've got, um, you know, issues when insurance changes to when insurance is purchased. Um, on a small group, again, benefits are changing, plan designs are changing, and uh, to a certain degree, the, the shop, the, the shop exchange, which we'll talk about in a minute, is also going to potentially change the way uh, insurance is purchased at least some degree. Large group uh, changes as well. Uh, they've got their own mandate, which doesn't go into effect until 2015. Uh, but uh, there are some new limits on the way uh, uh, large, uh, large employers uh, have to provide benefits. Um, first, from our perspective, uh, insurers had to file the qualified health plan requirements in order to meet the exchange. Those filings started in April for us. And um, there were some uh, you know, changes and bumps and, and, and other things throughout that time frame as we went, went through that. But functionally, uh, every single plan that any carrier has is changing. It's all brand spanking new. So we had to review everybody's rates, we had to review everybody's forms to make sure it was uh, meeting the, both the state and the federal requirements. Um, the, from the individual market perspective, um, you know, I think the big changes for individuals, and I know most people are employers, but I think this is going to have an impact on a lot of employers. I think employers are going to start needing to be more aware of the uh, of the individual market. Um, you know, they're, they're going to have the exchange, which is functionally a website. I mean, let's understand what it is. It's a really, hopefully it's a really souped up website that works. Um, which is the subject of some consternation with some of the carriers across the country as to whether or not it'll work. But it's, it's functionally a website, and, and individuals are going to be able to go on that website, and they're going to be able to take a look at uh, whether or not they qualify for a premium tax credit. And that's going to have an impact because they're going to look at, at what they're paying with an employer, and uh, as far as their premium, <coughs> whether or not they get a better deal by not having insurance at all uh, from, from that perspective. Uh, they're going to be able to look at the specific plans that they're going to be able to purchase in, in that exchange. In that exchange. Um, and, you know, I think from an individual perspective, they're still going to be able to purchase broadly the way they purchase today, although the only way they can get those premium tax credits is, is, is through the exchange. Um, but they'll still be able to use agents. Uh, there are these navigators and certified application counselors we can kind of talk about if you, if you have questions. Um, but, but functionally, you'd be able to go to the same spot, you just have this additional uh, on-exchange uh, piece. And we're expecting that there's going to be, um, you know, we have 13 carriers who have filed uh, for policies on-exchange. Uh, we have roughly about 25 carriers in the individual market uh, right now. Um, assuming that number doesn't change, and we're anticipating that number's going to change, that means that there'll probably be a few more choices off-exchange that are on. But again, the only place individuals can get that tax credit is, is, is on the exchange. The way people purchase insurance um, in the individual market also is going to change. When you were looking at today, you had the issue of they have to go through underwriting. If they go through underwriting, that means they might get an increase in their premium if they got it because they're, it's subject to, to uh, uh, health rating. Um, so their, their premiums could increase from what the quoted rate is. Um, and they could be rejected. If they're rejected, they, they have the ability right now to go into the state's high risk pool, which is, which is ending. Um, but it, but going forward, they'll be able to guarantee issue coverage. Um, in, in, in the new market, it is going to be guaranteed issue, so you're not going to have the issue of somebody having the concern about being rejected. So when you're dealing with uh, COBRA benefits, when you're dealing with uh, state continuation requirements that are still in place, that means that individuals are going to have some options to take a look at what they want to do uh, going forward. Uh, they'll have an open enrollment period every year where they can have guaranteed issue coverage. It's possible that they'll be comparing the COBRA and the state continuation to 
what they'd be able to purchase uh, in that market, in that market every single year. Uh, alternatively, um, they may have those options uh, at, at, at the time when they're losing their coverage. You may, they may have the option of, of going into that market. So that's going to get more complicated from an, an employee perspective. Um, the benefits that are going to be inside these policies, um, you know, today when you're looking at a small group plan and you're looking at an individual plan, functionally there's some differences. You know, things like maternity are typically covered under an employer plan and uh, are, are covered under an employer but aren't typically covered in the individual market. Going forward, those benefits are going to be closer to spiccato uh, between the two of them. Essential health benefits requirements apply to the individual and small group market. So that, that's going to mean that those benefits, and, and, and to a certain degree, the large group market in, in a different way. But functionally, those are going to make some changes in the way that people are looking at benefits when they're making those decisions. Um, so that's something that's, 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 that's going to be different from a, from a choice perspective. Um, in addition, um, you know, they've got this individual mandate piece. And the individual mandate, um, you know, the good news here is that the federal government has essentially said <coughs> basically any coverage is purchased in the individual market, any coverage is purchased in the small group market or the large group market by an employer generally is going to qualify for their mandate. So it shouldn't be a big issue. When you're looking at, however, when you're looking at um, the requirements for, for uh, the subsidy piece, this is going to be an important thing to understand uh, as to whether or not an individual is eligible for subsidies. Um, there are two kind of tests that an employee goes through. And the first is uh, that the, the contribution, their contribution to the premium has to be less than 9.5% uh, of their income. Okay, that's test one. And test two is this, uh, is this minimum essential value, uh, which uh, it is a bronze, essentially what's, what's called a bronze level plan. I'll get to that in, in a second. Um, it, that essentially gives, um, means that you have to have that bronze level plan as an employer or above. If you have a plan that's below that, if you're requiring them to contribute more than 9.5% of their income, they're going to be eligible for, for coverage in, in uh, subsidies in the exchange. That's important um, for, for larger employers of 50 or more because that means if an individual uh, accesses subsidized coverage in the exchange, that means that there's a potential $3,000 uh, fine or, or, or penalty for the employee for not providing affordable coverage. Now, that's only for individuals who, who uh, access coverage in exchange. This has also been delayed a year, so it doesn't really matter the first year. The other, um, the other piece of this from, from an employer perspective, uh, two other pieces of this, there's obviously the mandate, which requires you to provide coverage only at <coughs> of 50 or more. However, it's, it's, it's full-time equivalence. And again, this is a 2015, not a 2014. But it's full-time equivalence. That means that you count your part-time employees in this count to see whether or not you have a mandate. The fine is based on, um, uh, is you get an exemption for the first 30 employees, so there's no fine for the first 30 if you don't provide coverage. So anything above that. Um, if your part-time employees, just, just to give you an example, if your part-time employees, let's say you have 40 full-time workers, and you have, you know, let's say another another 40 part-time workers, and you know that equals a total of when you when you use equivalents that equals 52 employees. Okay, you would be subject to that mandate. Okay, but you'd only have to provide coverage for those 40 full-time employees. So if you didn't provide any coverage, the the only the, the penalty you'd have would be 40 subtract the 30 exemption. So you'd have 10 times 2,000. That would be the, the penalty for uh, not providing coverage. Um, for small employers, so that, that's going to be an issue, but that's for, for, for larger employers. For small employers, a lot is changing as well. Um, small employers are subject to these actuarial value plans, uh, this bronze, silver, gold, uh, and platinum. And if you think about it, and they have actuarial values attached, in general, requirements as you move up in that in 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 those tiers you're going to have more upfront dollars paid for by the uh, you know by the plan so if you're looking at a platinum plan which is a 90 percent natural value it will tend to have lower deductibles it'll tend to have lower cost sharing it'll tend to have lower co-pays um, and if you're looking at a bronze you're going to start off with a higher deductible 
There's also a limit for small employers, which is going to be, I think, uh, uh, over the next couple of years, going to be a really big change for risk problems. And that is for small employers, although they're not mandated to provide coverage, on top of those having to fall within that actuarial value, you're required to, uh, your maximum deductible is $2,000 uh, per employee, uh, $4,000 per family. You are allowed to make an adjustment on that if you contribute to the to the health savings account, a flexible spending account, or some other similar arrangement. But you're stuck with that two thousand dollar maximum deductible. You will not be able to buy a plan with uh, a different deductible uh, than that unless you you know indicate that you're contributing to that. That means that, and in, in, in when we look at what small employers are purchasing today, it is kind of all over the board. You have about 30% that have a deductible under 1500 You have about 30%, 30 40% that are in that 1500 to 2500 And you have the remaining 30% that have the deductibles over about $2,500. Um, so that means that you know these these people over here are likely going to have to move into those, uh, those lower deductibles, which is going to have an impact on cost. Um, with that, let's see. I think the only other, um, you know, there. I think the other folks will talk about some of the other pieces. There are going to be. A, there are a lot of regulatory changes. Um, to touch base a little bit on the, the, the shop exchange, um, we obviously had 13 carriers filed for the individual exchange. We had nine uh, for the shop exchange. Uh, those contracts for the exchanges are in the process of being signed now. The carriers will probably be able to explain that a little bit more. Uh, but I think the expectation is by the 12th or the 15th, we'll be able to, to know who is in fact uh, signed contracts formally to be on the exchange. I would say that um, from a coverage perspective, um, we've already had some movement and changes in the areas that uh, certain carriers are covering. There are expansions, there are contractions, there have been changes since they filed with us. Um, we uh, was on a call yesterday with uh, Cicero talking about the contracting process. None of our carriers indicated they were doing any changes, but um, on, on the section of the call I was on, but a number of other states had carriers who were making changes to their plans, and we're talking about that. So this stuff is still, despite the fact that we're looking at October 1st and today is September 11th, um, it's still really, really fluid. And I think I'll leave it with, with that, and uh, we'll be happy to answer the questions. Uh, whenever that makes sense. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and hopefully I'll pop that up. I'll stand up and kind of the pace around and it gets close on time, by the way. That's my universal signal for <laughs> <laughs> the gong show hook thing. That's why I want to get up here. It's hook time to say it. Um, 